Welcome to the NJ Spotlight Roundtable Series. In this program, the impact of Medicaid expansion on New Jersey's healthcare system. This program was recorded in Trenton, New Jersey on March 7th, 2013. This program is brought to you by Amerigroup Real Solutions in Healthcare, the Hospital Alliance of New Jersey, and the Nicholson Foundation. Panelists on the program today are Dr. Poonam Alek, former commissioner of the New Jersey Department of Health and Senior Services and a board member of the Common Sense Institute of New Jersey. Raymond Castro, senior policy analyst from New Jersey Policy Perspective. Susanna Yanni, president and CEO of the Hospital Alliance of New Jersey Incorporated. John Kern, CEO of Amerigroup New Jersey Incorporated and State Senator Joseph Vitale, Vice Chair of the Health, Human Services, and Senior Citizens Committee. Moderating the program is Andrew Kitchenman, healthcare reporter from NJ Spotlight. In this program, Chapter 1, Introductions and Opening Remarks from the Panelists. At the lectern to introduce the program is John Mooney, founding editor of NJ Spotlight. Welcome, everyone. My name is John Mooney. I'm founding editor of NJ Spotlight. And I want to thank you all for braving the two feet of snow that you all had in your hometowns. I know it was a little scary getting here, but we appreciate it very much. Um, this is a big event for us and on, on several levels. Uh, as you know, it's, we're going to be focusing on Medicaid expansion. And um, first, it's obviously a critical topic that's sweeping the nation as well as New Jersey. Uh, the timing is, is great. We want to give a shout out to Governor Christie for making the announcement right before the round table for us. Uh, it, it makes it a lot more topical, um, but it's obviously an issue that the state is going to be dealing with uh, for the next you know, foreseeable future, and I think some really important discussion and, uh, that can go on, and we have a fantastic panelist uh, to speak to it. It's also important for us, this is, um, we've, we, we have added to our core in the last six months, Andrew Kitchenman as our healthcare reporter, uh, and this is his first roundtable. But it's also it, it, it brings healthcare back into our our catalog of coverage and and discussion, which I think is so important and, and really important milestone for NJ Spotlight, and I think hopefully for the state in 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 that coverage. And so I, I'm sure you all will welcome Andrew to the podium uh, to speak to it as well. But um, it's it's really exciting, very exciting for us to have, have him with us. Uh, a few logistics. Um, on, your, on your tables, we put out a b bunch of sheets, uh, biography sheets, and hopefully we have enough. The, the attendance here is fantastic, and, and we will be posting a lot of this stuff up on the site if we don't have enough. Um, but there's a biography sheets that also include emails that, everyone, that the panelists were willing to share so you can continue this discussion with them. Uh, there's also uh, recent articles we've written about Medicaid expansion. Uh, Andrew put together a fact sheet as well uh, that gives sort of a rundown of, of the issues and, and what will be talked about today. There's also index cards. Um, and we really hope that these sessions engage you guys into asking questions. And, and we'll at least start those with index cards where you can jot them down. And then we will be walking around sort of the outskirts of the room, catch our eye, wave the card, and we will get the cards up to Andrew, who will try to incorporate them in the, in the discussion. Um, what's an event without a hashtag as well? Um, and yes, we are going to be tweeting this event. And you will see on, your, on the uh, tables is the hashtag. It's just simple NJ Medicaid. Um, feel free to do it as well. And, and those out there uh, outside the building, uh, we've, we've learned that these things can get quite a bit of discussion online as well. So we engage you in that. I want to introduce our team who will be walking around just um, to, to highlight them a little bit. It's, it, this is very much a team effort, NJ Spotlight, we've been doing this. We're coming close to our third year and um, it is, it's been an exhilarating and exciting experience, but uh, there's a lot of folks involved in that. Uh, Kevin Harold, our publisher, uh, we have Lee Keo. oh yes, definitely applause. Uh, Lee Keo, our managing editor. Uh, Tom Johnson is out here somewhere. There he is, our energy and environment writer, and Paula Saha, who's our uh, social media and online community. I also, of course, want to thank 
first and foremost our sponsors for making this happen. Uh, we, we really couldn't do this event, and to be honest with you, NJ Spotlight couldn't even sustain itself without the help of sponsors. And I really want to give a shout out to each of them. Amerigroup, uh, Hospital Alliance of New Jersey, the Nicholson Foundation, and Citizen Action. So we want to thank them very much as well. So enough about that. Again, I want to introduce Andrew. A lot of you know him. Uh, and if you don't, I hope you use the opportunity to come over and say hello to him afterwards. He, he, you may know him from his work at, at Trenton Times and NJ Biz, but now we are very proud to say he is part of the New Jersey Spotlight team. So it's all yours, Andrew. Thank you, John. So the uh, Medicaid expansion that Governor Christie announced last Tuesday is one of the, the two major features of the Affordable Care Act that will expand coverage uh, in New Jersey along with the Health Benefit Exchange, both of which will be coming to an effect on January 1st of 2014. Uh, I had reported that the Medicaid expansion would increase coverage to 234,000 uh, residents if the governor decided to do it. And when the governor announced it, uh, he announced that it was 104,000. And uh, I know I wasn't alone in trying to understand uh, a little bit more about the, the difference in those two numbers. And the, the two numbers actually do line up. The 234,000 is everyone new who will be covered by Medicaid according to a uh, estimate by the Rutgers Center on State Health Policy. Um, well, the 104,000 is just a subset of that 234,000. Of, of the people who are newly eligible and will be receiving coverage. And I just wanted to clarify that because it's a pretty fundamental point in describing the scope of what this ex expansion is. Um, the format of this will be that I'm going to introduce each uh, member, uh, give them a five minutes to talk, and then move to the next member of our really uh, amazing panel that we have that, that ranges in uh, philosophy and experience. Uh, and then uh, after uh, I uh, ask about one question of each panelist and, and they talk for a few minutes with their opening remarks, um, I'll, I'll be asking a few more questions and then I'll be taking those, uh, those questions that you've submitted on the index cards um, that are on your tables and our, our uh, team members will be bringing over to me to, uh, to, answer the, uh, to ask the panel. So. Uh, Last year, before the governor made his decision, Senator Joseph Vitale uh, sponsored a resolution urging the governor to expand Medicaid. Uh, he's also been a sponsor of many, if not most, of the state's major health-related bills uh, in the past decade. Uh, he represents the Middlesex County-based 19th District. And uh, Senator, uh, please tell us why you supported the expansion and what legislation you're planning to follow up on. Thank you. I also want to thank New Jersey Spotlight for hosting this again. It's, you know, look around the room and recognize most of the faces who are here uh, uh, today. And uh, they've been involved in these issues for quite a long time. I want to thank you for your participation. I also want to recognize Governor Florio and former Senator Gordon McGinnis, uh, two men who have made a real difference in New Jersey. It's great to see that the governor embraced uh, those elements of the Affordable Care Act, uh, and although I don't think the governor would quite put it that way, uh, and he didn't, uh, wasn't quite an embraced, but uh, he did recognize what he said in his words was a value to New Jersey. Uh, of course, he did say, though, that in the outlying years, if he thought that New Jersey uh, was going to be on the hook for additional contributions to their share of this, and that he would reconsider uh, the program. Uh, as we all know, that this is you know free for three years, and then the and then the contribution uh, ratchets up to 10 percent for the state in 2020. Uh, it is, of course, uh, a significant uh, move in the right direction to provide health care for low-income New Jerseyans. Uh, the the administration over the past uh, three years, uh, particularly with relating to as it relates to family care, we've sort of pared back enrollment uh, from what was 200 percent of poverty for working parents to 133% of poverty for working parents. And also a little known uh, regulatory scheme that has essentially led to tens of thousands of previously enrolled parents having lost coverage because their uh, part of uh, their income is derived from unearned income. And if that exceeds 30% of the federal poverty level, and this is all nerd talk, uh, that, um, uh, which means un 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 uh, 
Unearned income could be child support, unemployment, disability. Uh, they would be disqualified from either entering the program or disqualified when it is that they renew their enrollment and their membership in family care. So those things have to change. Uh, we know that you know when the Affordable Care Act finally takes place, that uh, those parents will, and many of them, not all, will be eligible for uh, enrollment in the exchange. And for those who are eligible for Medicaid, obviously, will get uh, into the program. The challenge will be, as we all know, and the panel here will discuss this as well, is how do we reach these people? How do we get them enrolled? And so I have introduced uh, legislation, I'm planning to, I haven't already introduced it, uh, but writing legislation that would really establish a mechanism to enroll uh, every individual who's eligible for Medicaid at any point of contact. And so the point of contact could be at a hospital, an FQHC, a clinic, uh, any place that they, a patient presents uh, for care, a doctor's office potentially as well. Uh, we do this now and, uh, in terms of presumptive eligibility uh, for, uh, for many of those who are covered in some of the programs. And in our hospital settings, for example, we no longer allow uh, children who are born uh, in this state uh, without insurance uh, to be a, a charity care patient. Uh, they are auto-enrolled in a program uh, that fits their income. And we could think about doing something like that for those who are eligible for Medicaid. There are certainly lots of challenges uh, and, and uh, administratively and practically uh, to do that kind of work. Uh, but those are the challenges ahead uh, for those 200,000 or whatever the number may be, uh, individuals who are eligible. It's not going to happen overnight. And this will take time to reach people, to educate them. Uh, we are at a disadvantage here in New Jersey in terms of federal dollars for outreach uh, for the program and for the exchange. Uh, so we'll have to find a way in which we can fund some of these programs to do you know, real competent, thoughtful, and effective outreach for those who need to enroll in the program. Uh, so uh, with that, I'll thank you again for being here and for the opportunity to address you today. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Ray Castro is the senior policy analyst for New Jersey Policy Perspective, a think tank focused on the interest of low to moderate income residents. Uh, he has written a series of reports on the potential benefits of the expansion, including the amount of federal spending it would bring to the state, the number of jobs it could create, and the savings it could bring to the state government. Uh, can you tell us more about the impact uh, of your forecast uh, on the expansion and what it will have on the state? Sure. Uh, yeah, so what I'll do is um, I actually wrote three reports uh, on this issue, and I'll, I'm just going to su summarize them. And I think they dispel a lot of myths uh, about the expansion. Uh, our fir first report was on the number of workers um, who would be el eligible under the Medicaid expansion, but I think there was a common conception that there weren't a lot of people who were employed. And actually, we found that slightly over half of everyone who was eligible uh, for the expansion is working either part-time or full-time in a very low-wage jobs. Uh, we also found that they were employed in about 71% of all job categories in the state. Uh, so there was at least one uninsured wor 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 worker in 71% of those job categories. So it just shows you how widely distributed this problem is. Um, we found that the most common jobs were in restaurants, construction, grocery stores, and so on. The, I, I have a list of the top 20 uh, in our re re report. And by the way, all of our reports can be found on our website, njpp.org. Um, but basically, these are the people that we see every day. Um, our, our second report looked at the economic impact of the uh, expansion. Uh, we estimated about $1.7 billion would be spent in New Jersey on an annual basis over the, over the next nine-year period. Um, that's equivalent to building a MetLife stadium in the Meadowlands every year. So it just gives you an idea of, of the econo economic Im impact of this. Uh, we also looked at this uh, in terms of each county. Um, we found uh, s s significant f funding in every county because um, even though we have a lot more uninsured in the lower in in income ca counties, uh, even in the wealthier ca counties, we have uh, a much higher uh, uninsurance rate than you might imagine um, because the recession has affected them as well. So the, the funding would be widely distributed uh, throughout the state. Um, right after our, our report, the uh, Families USA did a more detailed uh, economic analysis, and they came up with an estimate of 14,500 jobs that would be cre created as a result of the expansion. To put that in perspective, um, the largest employer in New Jer Jersey employs 8,000 jobs. So, so that's good news as well. 
Uh, the third report, and the one that probably got the most publicity, was the impact on the state budget. And the reason why I wrote that report, because I, I was quite concerned that there were um, a number of legislators who were concerned that we could not afford the expansion, which um, I, as you might have heard from, from the, the bio, I, I worked for the state for 30 years. I was a federal relations d director. So it was my, my job to assess these type of federal programs. And so I, I just sort of did the math in my head, and that really did not make, make sense. So I thought I'd better redo a, a report on this. Um, and uh, what I looked at is the uh, existing caseload in terms of the, um, uh, the, ch the childless adults and, and g g general assistance, as well as the um, parents in New Jersey family care. And the um, federal matching rate would be greatly increased, well, it goes up to 100%, um, in the expansion, whereas it's only 65% and 50% per, per, per percent for those other groups. So there, there's a big jump in, in the, the federal ma matching rate. And that's where, where the savings are generated. Um, at least that's where I, I, I focused on. And so when you take that into account, um, I estimated about $2.5 billion in state savings um, uh, over the nine-year peri nine period. And that more than offsets the $1.5 billion in the matching funds. Um, so, and, and that was just in one area. There are a whole lot of areas that I identified in the report in terms of uncompensated care, uh, me mental health funding. We we're even finding that there, there are very high medical costs in the prisons that it looks like we may be able to claim uh, under the, and, and that was not in the report. So my uh, um, estimates were on the conservative side, I think. Um, and of course, we, we were, and the other aspect of this is, and I think this is the real kicker, which is that uh, if you don't do this, uh, the state would have lost $4 billion. And so the state would have had to make, so, 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 the, so the decision for the governor was, you know, do I save the state 2.5 or, 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 or do, do I have to come up with, five, uh, with four, four, four billion dollars? So I think that was a pretty easy equation to, to, to solve. Um, the, uh, and, and then as I mentioned, there's a lot of other savings and I'm not identified in the report. We, we, we were quite happy that the um, governor's office came to the same conclusion as we did um, they have an estimate of $227 million in the fir first year. Ours, ours was a longitudinal analysis of whether it wasn't on that. That's only for six months, by, 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 by the way. So the impact, and that also applies to the, the, the 100,000 adults. They're planning, and so the, the, the Rutgers estimate and my estimates are based on annual. So you can see the impact here is going to be um, very, very uh, substantial. Um, the, um, most common conclusion that we made from these reports is, is the uh, great need for out outreach. So we're, we're very um, enthusiastic about the, the senator's efforts in this, in this area. Um, we have a lot of barriers uh, in, in our state. Um, one is we have a poor record of outreach, quite frankly. We don't do a lot of outreach at, at, at the state. That's because it requires state matching funds. So we don't have the infrastructure out there. A lot of other states have worked with community-based organizations for years in their um, family care program, uh, we don't have that experience and we don't have the, the, the uh, community-based organ organ organizations that we can tap right, right, right away. They have to be uh, enlisted and identified. Uh, also, we just don't do well in participation rates. Uh, we're se second last in the country in the food stamp population, which I'm afraid to say is very similar to this pop pop population. So to give you an idea, the um, participation rate nationally in food stamps is 65 percent. We're at 49 per per per, per percent. Uh, my um, the, the estimate that I came up with uh, 1.7 bill, billion, and I believe uh, the records estimates as well assume a 70 percent participation rate. So that's quite high. It assumes enhanced outreach, which we do not have yet in, uh, in our state. We have a very challenging population here to to, to reach. Um, you know, the, the largest population are going to be Latinos. There is language and cultural barriers. Uh, there, there are particular there are people with mental illness and substance abuse. We have, to, you know, this is going to be more than putting a billboard on a bus. I mean, we are going to have to go work with community org organizations, and these communications they have, have to know where these groups are, and they have to have trust in, in the, these groups in order to get uh, in, in order to apply for the pro, pro program. One of the biggest problems is that we don't have the funding. Um, this was one of the biggest downfalls of us going for a federal exchange. Uh, if we had had the state exchange, we could have applied for funding as part of the exchange grant. No cap on funding. Um, Mar Maryland, for example, is planning on spending $25 million. Most of that's going to be federal. Uh, we are unfortunately um, are only going to be able to apply for a navigator program, which is going to be announced in, any day. Um, that's a fixed amount. We, we do not what our, know what our allocation is. I'm, I'm guessing around three or four million dollars. Um, but uh, so um, we are um, uh, 
go, going to need to uh, identify a, a, a funding source on, on that, and we're, we want to build on, on the Senate Senators' legislation. We need to work, work with the, the, the healthcare industry foundations, but we need to put all of this together for this program to be really successful. Thank you, Thank you Ray. Suzanne Ayani is the president and CEO of the New Jersey of the Hospital of the Hospital Alliance of New Jersey, um, which represents many of the state's urban hospitals. In her time with the association, she has advocated for her members through several changes and challenges in how they were funded. Um, how will your hospital members be affected by the expansion, and do you see the expansion affecting the number of low-income patients using emergency departments for primary care? Okay. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I'm glad we can all be here today. And as Andrew pointed out, the governor all announced announcing on February 26th it really primed us up for a good discussion today on implementation. Um, I'd like to say that New Jersey has really been a trailblazer in uh, you know, providing access to health care for our citizens. I'm, a lot of the work that Senator Vitale had done to expand family care, and as you know, we were already at the 133% for working families, um, has done a, a lot of good for our state. So um, I think while you had Ray give a lot of the numbers and perspective, I'm really here to give a, maybe a dose of reality. Um, it's, <laughs> um, it's all, oh, I like it that I got applause already. Well, let's, let's hope it continues. Um, it's always a positive to reduce the number of uninsured, and New Jersey has about 1.3 million uninsured uh, right now. Um, the estimates that Ray said and that the governor said in his speech, we would have about 100,000 new Medicaid um, eligibles with the expansion, which is great news. Um, let me caution, though, that we don't know how that will impact the charity care program and volume for charity care. So for, I see a lot of faces who are intimately involved with charity care because we have a lot of hospital representatives in this room, but I'll just give a broad overview of what that program is. It is a program that partially reimburses hospital for the hospitals for the care they provide to patients that access the hospital either through the emergency room or through clinics. It's, it's not all emergency room care, which I think is a common misconception. Hospitals work very hard to have uh, the patients access uh, care at the lowest cost and the most efficient uh, point of care. Um, right now, the cost of the program to our state's 72 hospitals is about $1.3 billion annually. We receive in state, state and federal funding total $675 million. So when you look at the difference between the cost and the reimbursement, we're, we're reimbursed about half the total cost of uh, providing a safety net program like, uh, like Charity Care in New Jersey. Um, so you can bet that hospitals would rather see patients enrolled in Medicaid, and we work very hard to do that. Um, before I, I move on to how we do already do work to enroll patients, I just want to say we can't get ahead of ourselves while it's all great news and a lot of us have been cheerleaders for Medicaid expansion. We shouldn't get ahead of ourselves and already plan for funding cuts for charity care. Um, and we need to learn from some things that have been done in the past, back really 20 years, and I can say I've been doing this 20 years, um, and a lot of us in the room have. When the Health Care Reform Act happened in New Jersey, there were a lot of reforms in pl put in place, including a health access program and so forth. Um, and embedded in that legislation were declining subsidy cuts for charity care because there was an expectation that, look, we have these programs, more people are going to take advantage of them, we're going to see a decline in charity care volume and costs. Well, what actually happened, the observations did not meet with the expectations. So when there were plans for funding cuts, what we had to do as a hospital industry was actually go back to the legislature and the administration and say, we didn't, those didn't realize. We still had a lot of patients accessing the emergency room through charity care. So um, I want to say that Medicaid expansion is a great thing, but we really can't get ahead of ourselves and look forward to making any cuts until we actually see the reality of um, what happens with uh, patients accessing the emergency room and our clinics for charity care. Um, besides that, there is a segment of New Jersey's uninsured that is undocumented, and it's about a third of the 1.3 million uninsured statewide. So those folks, no matter how successful Medicaid expansion and the exchange uh, may be, which we hope it is very successful, will always be uh, relying on the charity care program. So. A um, couple of things that I want to say that you may not know about, about hospi how hospitals already work very hard to be part of the solution. As I've said earlier, we would rather have a patient have 
a Medicaid card and be enrolled in Medicaid hands down over charity care. So do not think that my statement saying that we don't want to see charity care funding cut means that we aren't going to work as hard as possible to enroll patients in Medicaid because we already do that. Um, you may not know this, but hospitals right now pay outside vendors to work as financial consultants to educate the patients on all of the programs that are eligible, that they're eligible for now. Um, some of these vendors even, you know, make follow-up visits at the patient's homes. Um, so it is very hands-on and, and high cost. The hospitals pay hundreds of thousands of years for these vendors. Um, another thing that I actually just learned myself I did know that in some cases, county Medicaid outstation workers can work in the hospitals um, to help with enrollment and to expedite enrollment. But I just found out actually yesterday that hospitals pay for those county Medicaid workers. I thought that they were maybe assigned to, to help with the point of contact. And it can cost a hospital to have one Medicaid outstation worker work in their emergency room $100,000 a year. And how the hospitals pay for it now is from their Medicaid reimbursement. So. I just want to make the point that hospitals are already working very hard to bring everybody onto the Medicaid, and um, we're already, in terms of time commitment and money commitment, doing that. Um, and then Andrew had asked the question, do I think that the Medicaid expansion will reduce reliance on the emergency room? Oh, if only it was as simple as that. I mean, I think um, I've been on many, many ER task forces and hospitals do many ER diversion programs. We do programs to talk to patients who are frequent frequent flyers. Many of you have heard that term, those who access the emergency room more than eight times a year. Um, the truth is, a lot of Medicaid patients still use the emergency room for primary care. So having the 100,000 new enrollees on, you know, move from uninsured status to Medicaid doesn't automatically turn a switch and say that they're going to only go to primary care doctors. Now, part of the reason for this is behavior change is very difficult. And the hospital, it's a good thing, the hospital is seen as the trusted provider in the community where patients can get 24-7 care that's quick, that's efficient, that's high quality. Um, so. Hospitals have been doing programs, patient-centered medical homes, have working with our FQHCs. Um, a couple of my hospitals did an ER diversion program where they actually assigned nurse managers who followed up with the patients, arranged transportation for the patients so the patients would go to the clinics or their, or their primary care doctor. But all of this takes a lot of work. It's a lot of high-touch work that the hospitals are engaged in, but nothing turns a switch. So the short answer is, do I think it's going to reduce reliance on the emergency room? No. The long answer is that we're putting a lot of reforms in place to try to make, make those changes. And just the two takeaways that I would like to say is, um, from if you learn, learned anything from what I said, I think we should just, number one, manage our expectations. It's a great thing, Medicaid expansion, but it's not a cure-all. And that hospitals are already working as part of the solution. Thank you, Susan. Dr. Poonam Aleg is, uh, served as the first Commissioner of Health and Senior Services in Governor Christie's administration. Uh, she currently serves as a board member for the Common Sense Institute of New Jersey, a free market oriented think tank that has been critical of the Medicaid program. Dr. Aleg, what are your thoughts on the expansion? Well, I would actually uh, modify your statement about being critical. Um, I, um, I think what we've try to do as a nonpartisan uh, think tank is really look for uh, market-based solutions. Um, and so I want to thank you, Andrew and New Jersey Spotlight, for um, bringing uh, all of us here together. Governor, thank you for being here. I know this is uh, critical uh, in terms of what we need to do, and having your leadership as part of this debate is, is, is very important. Um, and I do also want to thank um, Senator Vitale. He and I are both very, very passionate about health care. And a lot of the richness in, in Medicaid in our state is as a result of the leadership and the uh, advocacy our senator has brought to the state. So it truly is an honor uh, being on the same panel with you having this discussion. So when we look at healthcare, um, you know, again, I'm a practicing physician and I've always been a practicing physician. And when a patient comes to me, um, an 85 year old uh, in the nursing home and I go to the VA, um, every week. <clears throat> and he says to me, Doc, is this what I have to look forward to every single day? I am in this hospital bed. I get up every morning in this bed. 
I am in this bed watching television. I am in this bed waiting for some family member to come by and see me. And I am waiting in this bed for that ultimate day to come when I leave this earth. So when, a do when, when that patient looks into my eyes and says this, it bothers me. When a patient, a 75-year-old, comes to me and says, I've lost my daughter to cancer, a 45-year-old to cancer, and this is not the way life is to be. This is not the way nature has um, uh, uh, made our destiny. Parents go before children go. It bothers me. So I think the fact that we've had this Medicaid expansion is tremendous. I don't think there's anyone uh, in this room that talks about the expansion not being a good thing. I think access to health care for every individual, every New Jerseyan, is an absolutely great thing. But we do have to think about how we're going to bring about true reform. Expansion is not reform. And I really do have to commend the governor and the administration and the legislature who worked together to make sure that we are on that brink of reform. We are one of those very few states uh, that have got a Medicaid, comprehensive Medicaid waiver approved. Key elements of those, that waiver that we got approved include transitioning patients from institutions to, law, to home and community-based settings. We in New Jersey spent 70% of our long-term care dollars. That's 27% of our overall Medicaid budget. That's 40% of what's being spent on our duals in long-term care services. How do we transition it so that we're actually rever reversing that shift? And 30% of our dollars are being spent on in institutions, and 70% go to keep our seniors, our elderly, at home where they belong, where they uh, have their dignity, where they have their autonomy, uh, and where they have their independence. That's a key provision of our comprehensive care, uh, Medicaid waiver. How do we bring behavioral health and physical health together? That's critical. I mean, I have to tell you, and I know John's going to speak, but having worked in managed care and ha having seen patients and having been at the state, some of the most challenging patients are patients who have comorbid conditions. And unless we integrate our behavioral health and mental health issues with our physical and medical needs, we're not going to be able to take care of the patient as a whole. How are we going to bring about administrative efficiency? That's a piece, a key piece of our comprehensive uh, Medicaid waiver. How do we increase throughput time? How do we get to the start and then to the finish line in the most effective and efficient way? Those are going to be key pieces. And then as healthcare is changing, we're looking at aligning misaligned incentives in our healthcare system. We're paying for more. We're paying for poor quality. And when you look at the district program through the hospitals um, where we have, uh, we're paying for quality improvement projects. That's going to be a key initiative. That's going to be a pillar in terms of how healthcare payments are going to happen. We're looking at Medicaid ACO pilots where we have partners coming together. These are the kinds of solutions that we're going to be looking at. And when you look at to what the governor actually did in terms of expanding, um, it was actually very reasonable in terms of the way his, uh, the, the administration's thought process was. It was, most importantly, expanding on a system that was reforming. There were other states that I would not even recommend expanding because of the fact that the system is so broken. So if you have a weak foundation, how do you build upon a weak foundation? So this was actually very good for New Jersey because we're already on that road for re on, uh, on uh, reforming our Medicaid system, and now we're building upon improving access to care. The other piece that was so important and that came out of the waiver was the negotiation that the team did. So a lot of the old eligibles actually moved into the en enhanced FMAP category. So it wasn't just uh, the, the 100,000, Andrew, that you were talking about, patients that are the new patients, but there's a tremendous hundreds of thousands of Medicaid uh, patients right now who, for whom we're getting the 50-50 FMAP, for which we've moved them into the enhanced uh, category and we're going to get the full 100% uh, coverage from, for them. So as a result of it, we have improved not only our system, but also brought in revenue to help improve our Medicaid program. One of the important things, and something that the Senator actually touched upon, was what happens with that gap in coverage. Because you have uh, the TANF population or the general assistance population that still gets coverage, the very poor population, at 23% um, federal poverty level. 
the exchanges don't start until 100% federal poverty level. So what happens to that donut hole? And that was an important piece, I'm sure, when the administration looked at it. You know, that was the most vulnerable parts of our population. Um, so again, for our state, given where we are, and given the fact that we're all working together as private par public partners to make it happen and having a bipartisan approach to improving health care and having leadership on this, not today, but for, for uh, decades now with our senator and his team, we have been able to uh, take advantage of what this expansion is going to be. Thank you, Doc. John Kern is the CEO of Amerigroup New Jersey, which serves as a key managed care insurer, both for residents covered through family care, as well as the many long-term care recipients covered through Medicaid. Um, John, how do you see the influx of new patients affecting managed care organizations, uh, especially considering uh, your carefully assembled provider networks, as well as case management, welfare incentives, and, excuse me, wellness incentives, and other features uh, intended to hold down healthcare costs? Well, look, I think one of the things I want to do is sort of put this expansion in context. But first and foremost, I think it's important to emphasize that this expansion is good and necessary because no matter what sort of cost reform is out there, no matter how wildly successful it is, the people who are in these income categories will never be able to provide and ins buy insurance themselves. So that's why expansion is necessary. Um, secondly, let me just say that this expansion, although significant, it is not unprecedented in New Jersey. Um, that was true with the recession in 2009, where New Jersey Medicaid added 130,000 people. In the past four years, with the recession and uh, program expansion, the Medicaid program has added over 300,000 people. And the plans have successfully dealt with that and will continue to do that um, in the future. One of the other things to keep in mind as we talk about Medicaid expansion in New Jersey is because New Jersey historically has had high eligibility criteria, the extent and percentage of growth in New Jersey is going to be far less here than, say, a state like Florida, which has historically had much lower eligibility criteria. So Medicaid expansion is important here in New Jersey. But on a relative scale, it is much larger in some other states, Florida being a, a good example of that. The other thing that I, I think is important to realize uh, as we think about that expansion is the current literature out there in terms of the increased demand for PCPs is the actual increased demand for PCPs will be relatively modest. And there's a Health Affairs article this month that you can look at that, that speaks to that point. And I think the plans networks bear that out as well. Um, I, I think the, the real big question, and Ray and Senator Vitale have gotten to this, and, and, and I know Senator Vitale has, has frankly worked for years on this, um, is that is New Jersey going to hit the enrollment targets that are out there? Historically, New Jersey has had very generous eligibility criteria, and yet the actual coverage achieved compared to some states which have lower criteria is less in New Jersey. We're not getting the enrollment. And, you know, I think we're going to talk about some of the reasons for that in terms of New Jersey. You've got a large immigrant population. We're sitting in between two of the more expensive media markets. There are some practical things going on there. Hopefully, the ACA with the navigators, does the tax consequence lead to higher enrollments? Hopefully, we achieve some of those coverage marks that, that are set out there that historically we've struggled to do despite the best efforts of the policymakers, frankly, both under Republican and uh, Democratic governors. So I, I think that's the big question. Thank you, John. For more information, visit the website njspotlight.com. We produce these programs in the studios of Lubetkin Global Communications in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, on the web at lubetkin.net. For everyone at NJ Spotlight, this is Steve Lubetkin. Thank you for joining us and take good care. NJ Spotlight, where issues matter. <laughs>